Hello, my name is David Bruce. Teleology is the name given to things that aim towards a specific goal. The word comes from two Greek words, teleos meaning end, goal or purpose, and logos meaning a reason or an explanation. So a teleological piece of music is a piece whose purpose is its ending. Any piece you can picture as like a giant arrow leading towards a particular endpoint is teleological. There's often something very exciting about this kind of piece. It's quite easy to follow. It's easy to know where you are in the journey towards that final goal. Maurice Ravel's most famous piece, Bolero, is kind of teleological. It's basically a simple dance tune which builds and builds until it can't build anymore, at which point it kind of collapses. So the teleology is really just in the orchestration. Ravel himself thought Bolero was too simple a piece. He described it as orchestral tissue without music, and he was shocked when it became an instant success. But Bolero is a good introduction to this whole teleological concept, which I think Ravel uses in a far better piece he wrote eight or so years before Bolero, La Valse. Like Bolero, La Valse takes as its subject a dance form, or at least the stylization of a dance form. In fact, this was something Ravel had done throughout his career. Many of the dance forms he chose were old or old fashioned the rigadoon, the minuet, the forlan, and the pavane, and of course, several examples of the waltz itself. In La Valse, Ravel takes the dance form and essentially depicts its birth its glory days and its death and destruction. So it's a journey through the life cycle of a dance form. So it's really a concept piece, conceptual art years before that became a thing. To understand what Ravel does here, let's think for a moment about what a waltz is. No prizes for getting its main feature, it's the three in a bar, three, four time. Ba, 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 ba. And apart from that, you might expect some fairly simple harmonies, lots of one and five chords. Well, in fact, it's the 2-5-1 progression that's particularly common. And perhaps some slight syncopations. The dotted rhythm is very common. And sometimes these join together to form a hemiola pattern, groups of two against the three in the bar. And this is something that Ravel plays with, as we'll see. And the mood of a waltz is generally happy and light. The waltz was originally a peasant dance that was popular in Austria, Bavaria and the Tyrol since the 1750s. Or in fact two dances, the waltzer and the landler. The waltz reached the height of popularity in 19th century Vienna, thanks largely due to the waltz king Johann Strauss and his son Johann II. The waltz came to represent the joie de vivre, the carefree, sensual joy of this period, and Ravel's intention was to pay homage entirely unironically to this tradition. But between his initial concept for the work, as early as 1906, and its final completion in 1920, there was, of course, one event that changed everything, the World War. In his book On Poetry, which I've talked about on the channel before and which you really should read, my friend Glyn Maxwell talks about how the effects of the war could be felt disturbingly clearly on works written during and after the war compared to those innocent pastoral works written before. For example, check out these two poems written by the same poet, Isaac Rosenberg, the first from before the war and the second literally written in the trenches. Flame out, you glorious skies, welcome our brave, kiss their exultant eyes. Only a live thing leaps my hand, a queer sardonic rat, as I pull the parapet's poppy to stick behind my ear. Droll rat, they would shoot you if they knew your cosmopolitan sympathies. So the horrific events of the war, the brutality, 
the millions of lives wiped out with little apparent reason, changed humanity's view of itself forever. And with it, the carefree world that had given rise to the Viennese waltz was impossible. So Ravel's piece is an homage to that world, but it also depicts its violent destruction. Whether or not Ravel intended it as such, and we'll look at that in a minute, it's impossible not to hear in the closing pages of the work the sounds of a carefree world being completely destroyed. So it's a piece that has three main sections. The opening is a rather fabulous piece of orchestral atmosphere where the waltz as a dance seems to kind of emerge like a life form being born in a primordial swamp. A heartbeat in the basses seems to suggest that the waltz has its origins deep within the body. And gradually, fragmentary melodies start to emerge from the haze. The second section is a pure, joyful presentation of the waltz at its best, melodic and joyous. And here we see some of the elements that Ravel will later tear apart, in particular the hemiola-like figures which undermine the sense of three in a bar, even in a standard waltz. And then there are the harmonies, some of which retain that simplicity we see in traditional waltzes. But already in these early stages, they actually contain some fairly striking dissonances. For example, by using chromatically altered accented arpeggios, which then slide into their resolution. As the piece progresses, the orchestration gets bigger and more intense, just like in Bolero. But so too does the rhythmic and harmonic language. Here's that hemiola again, but now it's thoroughly ripping apart the 3-4 bar in the brass and percussion. <laughs> Harmonically, chromaticism gradually creeps in. As George Benjamin said in his article about the piece, it infiltrates the texture like a virus. At first this happens simply with background chromatic whirring. But then the harmony itself splits apart into extremely chromatic polytonal chord progressions. Here you can see the main chords move down in minor thirds. Now it took me a while to work out what's happening in the upper chords here, especially with the strange spelling of accidentals. But I eventually worked out it's a sliding chromatic minor chord where every third chord is swapped out with a tritone substitution in the major. This means it forms a pattern that also moves in minor thirds, but in the opposite direction to the chords below. I've been trying to figure out what the relationship is between the two hands here. It's pretty much impossible to think of anything in terms of passing notes. My suspicion is that it's more about the sort of geometry of these moving shapes than the precise notes that are sounding at any one moment. If you're a serious theory nerd, I'd love to hear how you'd analyse this in the comments. Do let me know. A perhaps slightly simpler version of the same approach can be seen here. Two major chords move apart chromatically in opposite directions over a pedal E. The passage makes sense to the ear because of the strong linear motion, but the chords that result are extremely chromatic and pretty impossible to classify. Ravel's mastery of orchestration in these kind of moments borders on obnoxious. It reminds me of a really great jazz guitarist I know, I won't mention his name, but in the comments under his videos it's mostly other guitarists saying, wow, now I'm depressed. Sometimes an artist can be so technically accomplished it runs the danger of becoming the subject of the work. And there's something about Ravel's mastery of orchestration that almost lacks humanity it's so good. But yeah, that's just a minor criticism. So as the piece reaches its final goal, what is there left to tear apart? 
Well, the last thing to destroy in a waltz is, of course, the first thing we think about when we think of a waltz, that triple time three in a bar. And so La Valse ends spectacularly with a terrifying four in the bar, pounded out brutally by the entire orchestra. <laughs> I suppose it feels like one last violent kick of the boot to finish off the poor dance. It's interesting to learn that Ravel himself denied that the piece had anything to do with the war. Even before the war he had described his conception for the piece and talked about it ending with a fantastic and fatal whirling, which is a strange description for something he was also proposing to be a celebration of the dance form. For me, once you've heard the whole story of the 19th century, the waltz, and the fact that the piece was written just after the war, I think it's very hard to hear it any other way. But that may just be me. Do let me know in the comments if you hear it another way. I'd love to hear what you think. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, do please consider subscribing. Follow me on Instagram and Twitter for updates on other forthcoming videos. And if you'd really like to support the channel, do consider joining my patrons over at Patreon. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.